that we'll be talking about. Um, but at Starbury Bank, we want to acknowledge that we're on the homelands of the Abenaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. So we acknowledge the land and the people who have stewarded it through the generations. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm Ann Jennison. I act as uh, an interpreter in our Abenaki exhibit, their People of the Dawnland exhibit. Um, I also uh, have been a history teacher for about 20 years. I'm an Abenaki storyteller uh, for about 30 years, um, member of the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs, and also the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. And I'm not sure what we're calling me, but I'm some kind of an assistant to this new Native American Indigenous um, program at UNH too, which is a real honor. What am I called? An affiliate. An affiliate, affiliate faculty member. It is quite an honor. Well, Kwai Nidoba, hello friends. Um, the People of the Dawnland exhibit uh, is about the Abenaki who have had a 12,000 year presence in Northern New England and Southeastern Canada right up to the present day. Um, the name Abenaki and also Wabanaki it means people of the east, the place where the sun rises uh, in the morning, the dawn, hence, hence the people of the dawn land. Um, and we're going to move on. I, I think, oh, you know what? I just do want to mention who all these people are. We have the Western Abenaki here in New Hampshire, Southern Maine, and in Vermont and Northern Massachusetts. But included amongst the, the Abenaki peoples are the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet peoples, um, from the Abenaki territory is extending from southern New Hampshire, just a tip of northern Massachusetts, all of Vermont, all of uh, New Hampshire, all of Maine, uh, the Canadian Maritime provinces, and the uh, southeastern Quebec. So it's a quite a large territory that the Abenaki refer to as Indakina. It means our homeland. And the Abenaki people themselves, they don't call, we don't call ourselves the people of the East, we call ourselves the Alnoba, the, the people, the human beings. So welcome. I think we're ready for the next slide. Over to you, Alex. Okay, so what we thought we'd do in our presentation tonight is um, in addition to giving you a little bit of information about the content of the People of the Dawnland exhibit, we are gonna focus more on the behind the scenes, how this exhibit you know, came together and why we have it and who was involved and how the decisions got made. So the People of the Dawnland exhibit, if you haven't been in to see it yet since we opened last May, 2019, it's in the Jones House Discovery Center. So it's in this room in the front of the house that you might recognize as a um, teaching space for kids to learn about shopping in different time periods as they would have in Puddle Dock, uh, which was part of a very successful um, educational exhibit in the Discovery Center. Um, but Jones House had some space to kind of reorganize things um, recently. And I also wanted to point out the before the war photo of Jones House. Uh, before my time as the archaeologist at Starbury Bank, Jones House was the archaeological center where archaeologists worked upstairs. Um, and then there was exhibit space downstairs, um, including space for volunteers to work. So here's a photo from the 1980s of people sorting artifacts. Um, looks like they're possibly, oh, they're SB4, they're from the Sherburn site. Um, so Jones House has had quite a history. And in fact, this exhibit gave us the opportunity to bring archeology span back into Jones House, which yeah. was exciting. It was. So um, at Strawberry Bank, the collection of archeological artifacts that I'm responsible for is quite large. We have over 29 sites on the museum grounds, in addition to five sites over on Deer Street, the location of the current um, Sheraton Hotel. And so over a million artifacts, very, very few Native American artifacts. The uh, images you see on the slide here of some stone tools and some Native American ceramics is like half of the Native American collection. And so Ooh. none of them are associated with a specific house on the grounds where ancient indigenous people lived. 
the archaeological evidence that we find is sometimes even uh, mixed in among European artifacts, suggesting that the English colonists in the area were interested in the signs of the Abenaki people um, whose land they were occupying. Um, but because there's not a like, site-specific way to tie these particular stone tools or ceramics or other tools that we found, um, there wasn't really a place to display or talk about these artifacts until now. So we also wanted to give some examples of the ways that other museums in our region and beyond address native history and culture. Um, so there are some museums that are entirely about native art, native people, um, native language. So those include the Mount Kearsage Indian Museum in Warner, New Hampshire, the Abbey Museum up in Bar Harbor, Maine, the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, which is on the Mashantucket Pequot Reservation in Connecticut, and the Tomaquag Museum, which is right near the Narragansett Reservation in present-day Rhode Island. Um, and then other museums have, especially in recent times, sought to better include native art or native culture in their exhibits. Um, so the Courier Museum of Art recently showcased Abenaki traditions. Um, the Old Berwick Historical Society had a great exhibit a few years ago called Forgotten Frontiers so that showcased indigenous stories alongside stories of enslaved and English people. Um, and the Holding Up the Sky exhibit about the Wabanaki people was at the Maine Historical Society. So we feature these or, or mention these recent or present day museums as good examples that differ in a lot of ways from earlier examples of the way Native people were included in museums. Um, so the tradition for a long time was to feature Native culture only in natural history museums. Um, like at the Smithsonian before the new Native American um, or Museum of the American Indian on the mall, Native people were only in the Museum of Natural History, whereas other American um, cultures and traditions were in the Museum of American History. So there's kind of a complicated history between and among Native people in museums um, that I think Anne and I agree started to turn around in 1990 when a piece of federal yes. legislation, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, caused museums to take a more critical look at the types of artifacts and the types of stories they were telling about Native people. Um, we can talk about that more during Q&A if you're interested, but I just wanted to give you some examples of some of the um, modern museums that are setting great examples in the area that we were informed by. We have one more museum I, I wanted to mention because it's really in um, kind of the northernmost part of, of Abenaki territory um, up at the confluence of the St. Francis River and St. Lawrence Rivers in, in Quebec is uh, the Odenac Reservation. There are two Abenaki reserves in Quebec, and they're very close to one another. Uh, one's Odenac and one's Wollenac. Um, at Odenac, there is this um, Musée de Abenaki, or Abenaki, actually, that's how you say it in Abenaki and in French, um, that this museum opened in uh, 1965, and it was the first uh, indigenous museum in Canada. And then it went through some serious revamping about 15 years or so ago. And I've got to say it is a stellar museum. If you, if we ever get out of COVID lockdown and you wanna take a trip up to Quebec, it's well worth driving through the countless cornfields and forests to get there. Um, I had no idea what the farmland was like up there till Charlie and I drove it. My husband and I were able to go up a year ago. Um, at any rate, I would like to mention that they are also doing what Strawberry Bag is doing and building an online presence. So there are a couple of good online exhibits that you could check out if you want to do a search. Uh, be sure if you are not fluent in French to click on the English option. You can get it completely in English as well as in French. At any rate, let's, let's go on and talk a little bit more about museums, Alex. Okay, so 
uh, related, I guess, to the post-1990 era, there's been an increased call for museums and other cultural institutions to acknowledge um, the Native history of their area, to acknowledge the Indigenous caretakers of that land, um, and a shift toward ideas uh, to of decolonization, where we address um, the colonial histories of places and try to reverse the harmful effects of colonization and the way that um, documented history has tended to deprioritize or deprivilege stories of people who um, were not part of the documentary record before Europeans arrived. So here's just a couple other examples, um, a land acknowledgement up at the Abbey Museum that I mentioned in Bar Harbor and a booklet. This is just the cover page of a booklet from the US Department of Arts and Culture um, on on why acknowledge, like what's the point of making a land acknowledgement? What, how do you decide who to acknowledge? How do you put it together? Um, and an example from the Courier Museum of their land acknowledgement indoors um, and a discussion of the work of decolonization in the recent um, Museum, American Alliance of Museums newsletter. So with all this stuff in mind um, in the museum world, it helped prompt some of our conversations about the people at the Domland exhibit. So moving on toward creating the Abenaki exhibit. Um, I approached, actually, I, I, was, a, I, I was called by um, the education department um, at Strawberry Bank in uh, the summer of, I guess it was in the winter of 2017, um, and asked to come in for to uh, the storytelling camp to tell uh, an afternoon of Native American stories. And while I was on the phone, I asked the education director if there would ever be an interest in, you know, building some kind of a, an exhibit about the Native American people. Um, I grew up in Portsmouth and graduated from Portsmouth High School. And what I uh, was watching at the time when I was in junior high was the development of Strawberry Bank Museum is already strong in my conscience. But as you know, a mom and a working person, it took until I retired from teaching to have the leisure to do that. I had retired for about two years before I talked to Becky who very much welcomed me to come in and meet with some staff. That was, in fact, the first time I met Alex was in 2017. Um, and it was the beginning of a really lovely conversation and some genuine interest uh, on the part of Strawberry Bank in trying to develop some interpretation that would acknowledge the, the 12,000 year presence of the Abenaki people right in this area, as well as throughout all of, of uh, Indakana, all of Abenaki territory. So we had a meeting and decided that the best way to sort of edge in would be to uh, set me up for the summer of 2017 at a table in the back of Jones, the education center, um, the education building, and or one of the two, and um, have me demonstrate various um, Abenaki crafts. And what we found through that summer was people were very pleasantly um, uh, surprised to find me hiding there in the back room and we had some wonderful conversations and some really good feedback I think um, back at the visitor center about what we were attempting to do enough so that we continued on and again in the summer of 2018 um, and it, actually the first summer come to think of it the first summer I was in the t uh, cotton tenant north the second summer I moved into the Jones house it's been a while it's a little fuzzy I'm looking at the print thinking oh I forgot about that um and the feedback was still very good. And uh, the conversations were amazing. I was astonished um, how many people shared with me their, their own stories of their indigenous heritage and were delighted to see me there. Um, so this moved along until actually, maybe we can go on to the next slide. Um, in February of 2019, uh, our, our group of staff, who had had an ongoing conversation for about two years at that point about how we might possibly uh, develop more and actually have an Abenaki exhibit. We're meeting and sort of all of a sudden any obstacles there could have been fell away. We were amazed that um, in our conversation, it looked like a room 
could be made available in the front of Jones. And um, people were on staff were eager to make connections and to, uh, I'll let Alex tell you a little bit more in a minute about the kinds of uh, support we got from other institutions, but right uh, from among the staff people, uh, we had uh, the, the enthusiasm and the expertise um, and the resources, even from people's personal collections uh, to put together a rather respectable exhibit. And it was very exciting. It went from February to we were opening, we were setting up during baby animals um, at the very end of April and baby animals closed on Sunday and we were open, I believe two days later. Um, so maybe we we're setting up during baby animals. I don't recall, but at any rate, it happened very fast. May 1st, this exhibit was open and was open through the entire season of 2019. And again, was incredibly well received. So we got this little sort of postage stamp exhibit, but you know, it's a seed from which good things can grow and it's already um, vibrant. So let's move to the next slide and talk a little bit more. Yeah, so about the exhibit. I remember we, um, our working group went over to Joan's house in this room we thought we might repurpose and looked around and we're considering, you know, what could we include as activities, what could we include as information. And I think as um, any of you who have been in an exhibit space before can attest, when it comes to reading panels, less is more. Um, and it's so difficult to try to get across 12,000 years of history in a few hundred words. Um, but the first place we began is talking about an introduction to the exhibit and not wanting it to be anchored only in the origin of Abenaki people in the region. Um, so we created these three panels that are kind of long and skinny and go on either side of the windows on the wall right next to you as you enter the room. And it was important to us to, yes, of course, cover that ancient history in the long term presence of people in the region, and then to talk about their continued presence during the colonial and historic periods, and then to talk about their continued presence um, today in New Hampshire and the vibrant community and the art scene. Um, so as Anne mentioned, we, we worked, we reached out to a number of people, um, especially for the text of these panels. Um, including the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, which is a group based at UNH that Anne and I are both members of, um, which is a, a group of tribal and non-tribal people, students and faculty and community activists um, that works really well collaboratively together. Uh, it's both my opinion and my training that there should be no one voice on tribal history. So it was also really important for us to get a lot of perspectives and opinions incorporated here. One uh, of the things that we wanted to just really make a statement about is that we're not talking about a people who lived here 12,000 years ago. We're talking about a people who have a 12,000 year ongoing presence here in New Hampshire and Northern New England. And I, I really do believe that, that these panels were very, very helpful in telling that story. So let's move on again to the next panel. These are, are two panels that are up in the exhibit also. The one on the left um, tells, gives details about the traditional plantings, the agricultural practices of the Abenaki people. And central to that are corn, beans, and squash growing together. Of course, there are many other uh, food products that were grown or hunted or harvested, gathered um, or fished for by the Abenaki people traditionally. Um, but this was the core. This is what allowed Abenaki people to settle in one place and develop uh, large communities, even in the seacoast. And we have a map in the museum that shows that the year 1600, villages throughout the seacoast with the presence of several thousand people, uh, 20 years, this is 20 years prior to um, the pilgrims settling in Massachusetts or uh, English settlement here in 1623 in the seacoast area. Um, the other panel was a, a very supported effort by uh, Abenaki artists here in New Hampshire, 
So we need to thank Willow Green, um, who made the beautiful corn husk doll you can see on the top left. Um, Rhonda Besaw, who did the beadwork on the right, and Denise Puglio, that did the basketry down on the bottom right and around the corner there. Um, underneath the corn husk doll is an art called birch bark biting, and that was done by Liz Green Charlevoix. It's a beautiful art. And then we also included some of my work, which is what that, that drum is about. Um, and we have several other pieces, really lovely pieces throughout the exhibit. Um, but these are permanently on the wall so that we have a reminder of, of what the arts are about and what they reflect and what their meaning is for the Abenaki people. Okay, where are we? Next slide. Alex, you want to talk about this just a little? Sure. So we, um, it, since this is the Jones House Discovery Center, we wanted it to be interactive for people of all generations. Um, so uh, we worked with, again, some of our network of collaborators and borrowed this touch fur panel from our friends at the Old Berwick Historical Society, these touchable basketry panels from our friend Denise Puglio, um, who is a basket maker. And we also created a reading library here with a adult or you know nonfiction books up at the top and kids books down at the bottom with the idea that people could sit in the exhibit and read or um, this created a space also for our staff and interpreters to be able to borrow books from this library since this was a new um, you know new talking point for a lot of them this was a resource to help them educate themselves to feel comfortable working in the exhibit space. Okay, let's, oh, let's then, move in. Um, this is a, a little wall case that I got to put the archeological artifacts in to feature for the first time. Um, so the stone tools here and ceramics, and I guess I included this because it was just so satisfying to, <laughs> yeah, to have a home for um, these oldest yeah. pieces. So yeah. this blade here that you can see on the left uh, dates to the earliest period of human occupation in New Hampshire, 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, so I, I think it's great to be able to have that in a space where visitors can see it and get a sense of that deep history. Yeah, it's wonderful. It looks very impressive there. Uh, and it's amazing to me to see how many people stop and they really want to read every little piece of information about those. Um, this is just to mention that we do have um, at least two or three days a week during the season, usually um, different demonstrations going on of Abenaki uh, craft work. So I have demonstrated everything from uh, corn husk stall making to corn husk basket making, coiled basketry, uh, to making birch bark containers and baskets you see on the top left, um, the corn husk stalls on the, of course, the bottom left, dressed in traditional um, Abenaki clothing, 18th century-ish, uh, late 17th, early 18th century, beginning actually into the 19th century, and then some beadwork. Uh, also, the, the double curve style you see around that, it's a collar, by the way, it's a yoke collar for a regalia. Um, the double curves, and you see them elsewhere throughout the exhibit, are um, a motif that is specific to uh, Abenaki art. So whenever you see those kinds of double curves and things, you can be assured that they generated somewhere in um, the Northeast uh, from the Abenaki peoples. All right, in the next slide, just showing uh, some toys that are made by or for Abenaki people, a couple of corn husk people and miniature baskets. Uh, the things with the birch bark are like the old ball and cup game where you try to get the ball into the cup, except this time it drops through the hole. And there's a little button game that's like a spinner. Um, these are used by children, who actually, these are used by a lot of adults too, who come through the exhibit. It, people pretty much can't resist them. And that's been fun to watch. Um, we also, are uh, including, there's a new um, uh, Thanksgiving program that's being put together to educate children online. We usually have during the month of November at the museum, a program where schools bring children on field trips and they learn about how Thanksgiving has been celebrated throughout the generations uh, here in the Strawberry Bank area. And we of course included how the indigenous people look at Thanksgiving and have not only one Thanksgiving in November, but actually several throughout the year. 
and a bit of this with the toys uh, is going to be included in the school packet and the school in the a little bit of a recording um, about the Abenaki seasons and Abenaki Thanksgivings are part of that new um, online presence that the museum is developing as a result of COVID. I just wanted to mention here too that these toys in particular are really similar to other toys that kids who visit the site encounter through yes. our educational programming. Yeah. And one of the links we wanted to create for our audience, for our visitors here, um, is the similarities among kids, right. no matter the time period, no matter the cultural background. Uh, and so I think these particular toys really help yeah. with that. And we also talk about how they were used to develop motor skills, you know, mm -hmm. to teach skills that are useful in life. Okay, let's move on. So we, before we wrap this up, we just want to mention some of our plans for the future. Um, of course, this particular exhibit was not open this summer, thanks to COVID, um, but we have some immediate plans to add an interactive Abenaki language exhibit. And we've been in touch with Jesse Bruchak, who um, is, a linguist who works on Abenaki. Uh, and actually during the Q&A, Bethany could talk about that more. She's been the one working on that. Um, and then those fur and basketry panels I mentioned were borrowed to see how effective they, they would be. And so we're planning to update those. Um, and to complement the Three Sisters informational panel that Anne was talking about, we're planning to have an outdoor Three Sisters garden where people can experience the actual plants. So in other ideas we've been talking about for the future, of course, collaboration with Portsmouth 400 as we come up on 2023, um, we'll be commemorating the 400th year anniversary of English settlement and the beginnings of interaction between the Abenaki and the English. Uh, and so the museum will be working with that and, and we've already started uh, actually a, a, in partnership with Portsmouth 400, Strawberry Bank and Portsmouth Library a series called Indigenous Stories um, that a series of presentations at Portsmouth Library has been uh, sponsoring. Um, we'll have guest lectures and presentations by and about the Indigenous people of the Northeast. We hope to host the Dawnland um, Native American Story Festival, which is the only Native American storytelling festival in, in New England that I'm aware of. And it's been gone ongoing for uh, Six, it will be six years now, except that we had to miss last February because of COVID. Um, we hope to uh, host an intertribal powwow. When we begin, that would be an annual event on the grounds and quite exciting. Um, in my heart, I've really wanted to see a wigwam next to that Three Sisters garden when we get it. And we've started to talk about an idea um, of actually inviting people in the way they come in for the archeological school and, and participate in digs at Strawberry Bank to um, set up a school where people come in and participate in building a wigwam uh, and seeing what that structure is like and how very sound they actually were. They were good, strong structures to live in. Um, so we hope to have also have uh, more workshops that feature Abenaki crafts um, I'd be happy to teach people about how to make birch bark containers. It's very satisfying. It goes a lot faster than woven basketry. Um, and things like cattail mat making, the things that lined the inside of wigwams, the floors and the walls that provide insulation, um, corn husk doll making, beadwork, those sorts of things. You know, as people express interest, we will think about developing workshops to meet that interest. Um, Alex, I think you want to talk about if people want to pursue this a little bit more. Yeah, so because we can't welcome people into the exhibit space right now, we just wanted to highlight a few of our favorite books or authors from our little library, uh, including Lisa Brooks, who recently won the Bancroft Prize for History Authors, really big deal for her book, Our Beloved Kin. Um, Joseph Bruchak, a very prolific, prolific Abenaki author who's written dozens, if not, I think over a hundred books, um, yeah. especially for kids. So that is great, especially as we approach Thanksgiving. He's the father of Jesse Bruchak, mm -hmm. by the way, who's the language instructor uh, that we're working with. 
Sorry, uh, Alex. Go ahead. No, no problem. Um, yeah. Colin Calloway, who is a British historian who works at Dartmouth and also a very prolific author. Prolific. I don't know how yeah. he puts out so many books, wow. but his most recent yeah. is The Indian World of George Washington. Yeah. Um, you may have even seen him in the area talking about it recently in the past few years. And our colleague Siobhan Senior at UNH edited this beautiful volume called Dawnland Voices that collects historic and modern nonfiction and fiction from tribes all across New England. So those are just a few books we wanted to feature. Um, we're happy to talk about any of those other, anything else. Um, so that's the end of our planned discussion. And we'd love to hear from the audience if you have any questions. We'd like to say thank you. Olioni is how you say that in Abenaki uh, for joining us today. And Bethany, we're, do we have questions? We do have a few questions and I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question, you can submit it using the chat function. Um, so just go ahead and type it in um, and I will present it to Ann and Alex. Um, first uh, question I have here is we started with a land acknowledgement. Um, can you please talk a little bit about what a land acknowledgement is um, and what, what the point of it is? Why, why did we use one today? Do you want me to start or do you want to, Anne? Go for it. Okay, so a land acknowledgement is really a first step, I think. Um, I wanna highlight that, that it's, I don't think any institution or any state could make a land acknowledgement and then say, okay, we've done enough to acknowledge native history or native people. Um, what it is, it is an important way of reminding people that most of the United States is unceded territory of hundreds of tribal nations that, that were each, you know, different sovereign um, nations at the time of contact. And so it gives us a starting point from which to begin having conversations about um, the relationships that evolved in the historic period and the continued presence of Native people here today. But one of the reasons I think it's such a great way to start is that it prompts people to do a little research into oftentimes their very specific area. Um, and, you know, here we are in the Piscataqua River area. Oh, Piscataqua is an Abenaki word. I should find out more about that. Um, so it's a, a way to begin self-educating, I think. I think it also is really important. Um, well, it's important everywhere for some common reasons that Native people have either been, uh, for the most part, written out of American history. And I can speak as, a, as an experienced history teacher here at high school level in New Hampshire, very little um, Native history is addressed except in, in uh, seeing the, the Indigenous people as adversaries who are either in the way of European expansion or American expansion. Um, so they're either pictured as incredibly violent and inconvenient or not mentioned at all. So, you know, I've heard countless times people ask me or just comment, I didn't know there were any Indian people left in New Hampshire. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons for that. That's a whole story in itself. But land acknowledgement is part of the way um, it's a good, it's a good step. It's a good first beginning to acknowledge that this land is here. Um, and, you know, it was so welcoming to the Europeans because it had been well tended. There was clean water here. You couldn't drink the water in England in 1620. You had to boil it first. There were trees here. England was deforested in 1620. You know, there were, there were, uh, there was a, it was considered a wonderland and that's because it had been well tended for thousands of years. It, that's worth acknowledging. Other questions? And we would like to know, are there any plans to do, this kind of goes along with what you were just talking about, but are there any plans to do programs on the complicated relationships between the indigenous population and, and the English or the settlers? Um, and they gave as an example, the raid on the Abenaki at St. Francis by Rogers Rangers. I think there was a recent program about that. Um, I think during the old Berwick Historical Society's exhibit. Do you remember that, Anne? Do you know what I'm talking about? I I have heard it referenced. I didn't. I was. I didn't see it or hear it myself. Um, we have not. I guess if you're asking specifically about Strawberry Bank, we have not settled on making specific plans about presentations. However, 
those kinds of topics certainly would be addressed um, as we move along. It's certainly, it's part of the history of the Abenaki people. Um, and it's also with Rogers Rangers, it incredibly, in, in, inextricably connected to the history of Fort Smith. Uh, I mean, wasn't he the son-in-law of one of the Atkinsons and related to the Wentworth group? I'm pretty sure. I'm digging back into my, you know, master's work a long time ago, but uh, he was pretty well connected in, in Portsmouth and in the Strawberry Bank area and treated as, of course, a hero by the European and English settlers. Uh, not so much by the Abenaki. Um, are there any plans to incorporate Native American music or dance into our programming? We haven't discussed that, but that's a great idea. Well, and that would be part of a powwow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if people have had the opportunity to attend a powwow before. There's usually a big one every summer at the Mount Kearsage Indian Museum and a small one in normal falls at UNH. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the features of a powwow is singing and dancing and instruments. Um, right. And the and the powwows are are cultural celebration, but they also um, are social events and educational events. They're meant to be uh, welcoming to everybody, you know, regardless of of you know whether or not you're indigenous. Um, and so they are meant to be instructional, and people will be are always taught some of the songs. Definitely taught the dances, how to approach, uh, you know going into the circle and what the dances are about. Um, some of them are specifically for about hunting and some are about courting and, you know, they have cultural meaning and that's shared. Um, so definitely through working on developing an annual powwow, we would be bringing music and dance in, but there may be other opportunities as well. You know, we have had um, basically an entire season's delay on developing the Abenaki program because of COVID-19. And so we are only really just now beginning those discussions again, looking forward, hopefully, to uh, the next season starting in the spring in terms of the Abenaki program. There are ongoing programs of many kinds at Strawberry Bank now, but in terms of the native program, we'll probably be talking about that later this winter. So we're open to your ideas and we'd be happy to think about them and think of ways to incorporate them. And the last question I have, can you, this is directed to Alex in particular, can you talk a little bit about archeological evidence? Um, there isn't much or any um, at Strawberry Bank Museum. Um, what is it that we would look for? Um, for a permanent tribal settlement and what are we lacking? Hmm. Yeah, so like I mentioned, we have a very small collection of material remains. Um, we're, like I also said, we're able to date some of those artifacts to the earliest period of history. And that's based mainly on the technology and being able to compare the types of blades that we see. And then pottery wasn't introduced until um, much more recently, like, well, relatively recently in um, Abenaki history. But that's largely based on comparison with other sites because what we're lacking at Strawberry Bank are signs of permanent settlement that might include like remains of a fire hearth, um, remains of cooking an animal or butchering an animal uh, or the remains of a household. So Anne was talking about the wigwam structures that Abenaki people would have traditionally lived in before contact. And that's created with um, a series of saplings that are anchored in the ground. And anytime anything is anchored in the ground, you know, a fence post, a wigwam um, post, a house foundation, the soil is disturbed around it. Um, same when you, you know, dig a fire pit and burn stuff, um, it leaves a signature in the soil that differs from the naturally or geologically laid soil that we would typically encounter. Um, and so we have very few um, there's maybe one Native American post mold that I found while we were excavating behind the Yetton Walsh house in the middle of campus. 
um, but otherwise no signs of permanent settlement. But we know people were here both from those artifacts that are littered throughout um, the Puddle Duck neighborhood and from oral histories that tell us people were coming to the Piscataqua River to hunt and fish um, in the warmer months, kind of like our visitors to the museum continue to do today. Um, but yeah, we, the, the, like Anne was talking about, the impact on the environment of Abenaki people differs pretty significantly from the colonial impact. And, you know, they didn't, most of what we dig up is trash and they just didn't throw a lot away. Um, and then once urban development began in Portsmouth, if there were signs of cooking or, um, even temporary settlements, I suspect that they were kind of disrupted by the construction of houses. Absolutely. We'll Years of house building, gardening, plowing, road building, all of those things. Um, we should have probably also member, mentioned though that the, that the Abenaki people are um, well documented in the historic period in Portsmouth, including a treaty that was signed in 1713 that involved days of uh, negotiation with a large contingent of Abenaki who came into Portsmouth uh, at the end of Queen Anne's War and had their families camped out on Great Island. You know, it wasn't uh, in some of the other islands in the Piscataqua, they were not going to take a chance to bring their families into town. but. That record indicates um, that the governor of Massachusetts uh, sent some of these delegates into this into the city, escorted after the negotiations to trade uh, with people, and that was uh, not uncommon. That was something that had been an ongoing activity, except when it was interrupted by war. So before the English got here, there were thousands of Abenaki in the area. Once um, tensions started to break out, which happened in a big way about 50 years after the original settlement. Um, then the presence of the Abenaki in the immediate areas of English settlement uh, were interrupted, but there still was incredibly strong uh, Abenaki presence and interaction, whether it was positive or negative is a different issue, but the Abenaki people were here. And I think we actually have time for one last um, question. Um, and we had somebody ask about musical instruments. Can you talk a little bit about um, musical instruments and how we might be able to use those in programming or to you know, um, enhance our programming? I got drums and flutes. I'm not aware of a whole lot of other, well, shakers too. You know, um, there's one up behind me actually on the shelf by the birch bark container. There is a, a moose hide. Uh, rattle. It's made of moose hide and deer antler. So rattles, uh, woodland flutes were used for courting uh, as much as, as anything else. And um, drum, the drum is the, represents the circle of the earth in its rounded shape. And the first music that we all hear, the heartbeat of our mother, that's what the drum represents. Uh, the rattle represents actually our pulse. Everything is tied in to the, to the living earth and the interconnections. Um, so do we have plans to include a whole lot of drumming or fruit lessons or maybe drum making? That would be interesting. Uh, it would be really kind of cool to have a drum making uh, workshop and or somebody demonstrating Native American flute. We have connections with people who do those things and certainly could invite them if that seems appropriate as we go forward. Thank you for asking. That's kind of it's, cool. It's great to hear those types of questions yeah. um, because I <laughs> presume that people are asking because those are things that you would like to see. So please let us know what you'd like to see. Send us your ideas. Yeah. Any more questions, Bethany? Or are we right. letting people yeah. ponder? That is it. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And again, thank you for being members and supporting the museum. Um, and thank you to Anne and Alex. I did want to remind everybody that we do have another talk coming up. Um, that's on December 8th, 3 to 4. It's Getting Dressy, How to Wear Historic Clothing. And that will be with Maddie Beal, who is our role-playing coordinator. Uh, so keep your eyes open for that registration information. 
Um, and I hope you all have a great evening. I know we said that we would keep the um, chat room open, so I will leave this all up for anybody who wants to turn on their cameras at this point um, and mingle. Um, but anybody who doesn't wish to say is welcome to leave. And again, thank you for joining us.